aren't you guys like seen by the planes? Bolin, once we get down there, I need you to tear up those runways. We can't let those aircraft take off. It's a nice touch that they keep referring to the planes as simply aircraft rather than planes since it's the first time anyone is seeing anything like this. Why would there be fence posts but no fence? General Iroh, how about you stop just brainlessly wandering into open areas and getting your guys killed? You're supposed to be good at this, you're a general. Man, this shot makes it seem like these mechs are like 50 feet tall rather than like 15. Wow, they even set up a mod's signature entrance here, set up the stage so he can rise out of the floor and shit. Don't you have like an uprising to solidify? Wait, you guys weren't there a second ago. Did you also rise from the floor just a little later than Amon? You know, gotta give the big dog the spotlight. We have nothing to fear from the Avatar. Let's hear what she has to say. The spirits didn't give him the power to take people's bending away. He uses blood bending to do it. Amon is a waterbender. So I know the plan was to go expose Amon as a waterbender in front of the rally, but like, bad plan, right? You are the epitome of this movement's enemy. You are the shining star of all benders, and you're just gonna make it so it's your word against all these radicalized people's leader's word? How naive are you? In what world does this work? There's no way you can force him to waterbend. You got nothing. This was not as big of a gotcha moment as you thought. I can't believe you thought it was, honestly. Your family wasn't killed by a firebender. His father was Yakone. The scattered gasps are a little surprising, aren't they? Yakone was like 50 years ago now or something? If I'm living in the 1930s, I'm not sure that I would know about some gangster that lived in the 1880s. Then again, he might be some weird super-powered myth since he was so crazy. Also, you ever notice how Toph has six fingers on her hand in the shot? And his brother is Councilman Tarlock. What? Okay, I get that one. But I will show you the truth. I think this moment could have been really cool, but we'll get into that in a little bit. But I know this is just makeup, so do you have like a colored contact in this eye too then? The Avatar is lying! I'm telling you, he's a waterbender! They don't believe me. It didn't work. No shit, what were you expecting? I wouldn't have believed you guys even without the face reveal if I were them. Once again, Amon's personal squad is of changing quantity. Here's five plus lieutenant, and here it's four plus lieutenant. <coughs> oh got away. We saw them get away. I feel like I can feel this episode suffering from the 12 episode run in this season, you know? Horan Mako's whole plan is to show to a crowd of people that hate them that their leader is lying. No plan, basically. Tenzin and his family have been caught off screen and are now in danger. The B team literally just walks down a hill and gets knocked out. No fight, no interesting way to be caught. Like, I'm not trying to be a hater, but this does seem pretty rushed. Mom would hate you for what you've become. How dare you! Don't spit at me, bro. Come on. The airplanes are ready for takeoff, sir. See, this guy calls them airplanes because he knows what they are. Nice. So wait, do your glasses just kind of sit on your nose or do they rest on your ears? I'm getting conflicting reports here. <laughs> Oh, so this is how Iroh broke out of prison. He called in a favor from Naga. Yeah, okay. What do you know? Just like a future industries forklift. Comic readers seething right now. Pardon me, I just saw you sit down on the straps and buckle. Where's this other seat harness coming from? <laughs> yeah, give me a second. It comes up again in a minute. I'll cover it all then. Tonight, I rid the world of airbending. Forever. Come on, let them go. You guys are still spinning your things? The Avatar needs to be reminded of the power I possess. Whoa, that was like the quickest quick fire ever. That was like some high noon shit. All right, so this looks pretty goofy, first of all, but the thing with the magic system in the show is that when you start to open it up more, the logic gets weaker and weaker. The comics had a big problem with this. Like, Toph could run up walls, and Katara could fly, and Zuko could fly, and Aang could fly. And much like the one-hit kill moves, once your characters do them once, you start to wonder why don't they do them every time, right? So now this firebending wall run is unlocked for the rest of the show. That opens up the question of why didn't they use that in X situation from now on? Which, you know, you gotta be careful about that because those things will start to add up. General Iroh being able to, I know he only did it a little bit, but definitely non-combat enhanced fly opens up the idea of why don't other firebenders do that? And it helps that Iroh did it and he's never around, so maybe he's just fucking insane and he's the only one that can. But still, it's like 
if you keep ungrounding the magic, eventually your audience is going to turn on you and be like, well, wait, now hold on. It's like, you know how in Dragon Ball Z they were blowing up planets 30 years ago, and since then they've gotten 700 octillion times stronger? And it's hard to think, like, well, how come planets don't blow up when they, like, clip their nails or something? And everyone's just got to be like, oh, well, you know. Where are Pema and the baby? In prison. I mean, I know it's kind of fucked up, but shouldn't Amon also blood Ben Rohan, just to be sure? What? He's a villain. Don't look at me like that. Get them out of here. We'll create a diversion. Let's go get your mother and the baby. Prison break! Oh, uh, hey, Amon. Oh, no, it's like one of the worst slow-mos ever. He just did a jump. Wait, wait, you ran past this door, it wasn't closing, then you stopped, and then it was closing? What? And this isn't like a mind game or anything, they are in here. This scene feels pretty tense. I like that Korra is still frightened big time of Amon. But I sort of wish that we felt that more when suddenly she was cool with confronting him at the rally. Like, shouldn't she have thought, huh, this plan at least might not work, and then I'll have to face Amon? Her storming in to save Tenzin and his kids makes sense to me. Caution to the wind then, you just gotta do it. But as this scene plays out, I can't help but feel we're missing something, and I'll get into what that is at the end. <laughs> Ooh, a little wind up. I mean, he just did like one Snoop Dogg rotation, but it's something at least. <laughs> What the fuck? That shit seems highly impractical. Even if you did think of the situation where one of the planes got hijacked and you needed to have a dogfight. Wait, what? Why did it explode? It just stopped the propeller. Is that how planes work? I ask because I don't actually know now that I think about it. This one's a little more respectable. I'm not a complete asshole. I can recognize there would absolutely be some pushback to firebending that would allow you to maneuver yourself while falling. Seems totally fair to me. If we just had this moment, I'd be praising it. But non-combat enhanced flight for me just ain't it. See how I mean lightning and fire can become dangerously interchangeable when one isn't special? We just saw Iroh cast Snoop Dogg lightning to accomplish the exact same thing as he did with one normal fire punch. Thanks for looking out for me, Aang. Yeah, yeah, it's nice that Zuko's voice actor gets this line. I agree, it's cute. Naga starts running towards the mechs in this shot, but then expertly intercepts their cables in this shot, and then not only topples the, like, just tons and tons of metal, but then also seems to send them flying? How strong is this dog? I was gonna complain about her basically pawing the metal bars apart earlier, but if she can do this shit, then that was nothing. At least she gets to do something here. She's part of the effort, at least. She hasn't been demoted to cutaway gag yet. What do you think you're doing? You are aiding the very people who took your mother away! You don't feel love for mom anymore. You're too full of hatred. I've become so numb. Oh! I now see there is no chance to save you! You got a big spitting problem when you talk, bro. No one likes that. I feel like it might be hard to clock here, but Asami rips off her dad's mech's arm. Do... Do the forklifts also have a judo throw maneuver that rips off mech arms? Or you just freestyle that one? Finally. You are powerless. Right, so why didn't you do it in episode 4? You're saying finally. Just so you could make a bunch of planes and mechs before the rest of the world comes in and stomps your movement to death anyway? This shit doesn't make any sense, man. You don't have the men, you don't have the material. Korra still becomes a martyr here, you just did it a few weeks later. Everything the Avatar said is true, isn't it? I just saw you bloodbend her. Really? Because if you just got here, all you see is me standing over two benders. That's normal protocol. They aren't being visibly bloodbent at all. You served me well, Lieutenant. Do we not usually have fingernails and close-up shots in this show? Oh, no, we do. I had to go check. Your fingers look fucking weird, Amon. <sighs> So this is like negative windup, right? This is the smallest windup imaginable. Mako can't even move, or is at the very least battling to move an inch of his own free will. Clean hit as well, can't get much more square than that, and Amon turns out to be just fine. So of all the criteria for lightning is what we were shown in Airbender, this seems to be a completely different thing, which is fine, but calling it lightning doesn't sit right with me. <gasps> yeah, hell yeah, why aren't you doing that literally all the time? That's all I would do with my life. What the fuck? Impossible. Yes. I can airbend? I can airbend! Why? This doesn't make any sense at all. Why can Korra airbend? Amon took her bending. Just because Korra couldn't blast air doesn't mean she wasn't an airbender. Like, just because Aang couldn't move a rock didn't mean he wasn't an earthbender. Aang was supposed to learn fire last, and he did that way before earthbending. It's not like he had to unlock them in order or something. The Avatar is intrinsically a bender of all four elements. They do not become a waterbender when they first bend water. They were always a waterbender. Just like Korra has always been an airbender, she just hasn't figured it out yet. Which means Amon should have taken 
taken it with any logic, right? Which, since Amon hasn't taken airbending from anyone before, leads me to conclude is, what, you missed? This doesn't make any damn sense. Korra throws multiple air punches here, which once again confuses me. It seems like she's trying to firebend, but it's just getting airbending. But each time she throws two, but Amon is only hit once. <laughs> Korra can be bloodbent by both Amon and Tarlock, which means they're both stronger than her, which is fine. Korra's the Avatar, but she's young, and Yakone could bend Aang. Doesn't bother me. But now, Korra, as only an airbender, can overpower Amon so much that she ignores him completely, raises her hands above her head, and delivers a very powerful air kick. She's not even a waterbender at all anymore. How was she able to do this? She was just very determined or something? She wasn't as determined to not have her bending taken away? What's going on? <laughs> Did you see what happened? Who was that? And then the makeup thing. I thought the first time watching the show, wow, what a play from Amon. Actually disfiguring himself to push his rhetoric and cause. Genius. What an interesting play from the villain, right? Like, so much of this first season is about identity. Korra's identity is the Avatar, and how she can't live up to it, and how it's being threatened. Tenzin's identity is the only airbending master, son of Aang, and not being able to successfully teach Korra. Tarlok's secret identity is Yakone's son, and still being haunted by those demons because of it. And what is Amon's identity, period? A lot of it is about committing yourself to your work so you can take your place in the world, filling the true role you see for yourself. So how cool would it have been if Amon actually disfigured himself to be in line with the story he sells his movement? Like his father before him, he radically changes his face and sets off for a new life with new goals. But no, now we're left with the thought that Amon applies very intricate makeup to himself whenever he dons the mask, just in case. Which one sounds cooler? Which one fits with our themes better? But with his disfigurement being a lie, truly now, we know it is, what the hell is even Amon's motivation for any of this? He's on the weird same paradoxical logic as his brother, no doubt doubt that he still wants to take over Republic City, despite his dad being awful to them, and I guess that's just it? He thought Aang was the most powerful because he could take people's bending, figure out a way he could do it himself, and then spun a weird story about how he believes benders are truly evil to rile up angry and violent support. But as far as I know, he doesn't believe that. He just thinks taking people's bending is mondo cool. So what the hell is his actual motivation for taking over Republic City? He doesn't actually give a shit about the plight of non-benders, at least the show hasn't told me that he actually does. If the backstory he sells his followers is a lie, what if when Korra really got to see Amon's eyes when he was taunting her, we got to see a bit near his eyes that was actually burned? That would have been cool, right? He said Aang was the most powerful, got Aang's powers, and despite hating his father, did his bidding anyway, for no stated reason. This revelation makes Amon nothing more than a fraud who believes in nothing, and I don't really care at all anymore now. And I know he's thinking like, oh fuck, I'm panicking, I'm gonna drown, but really? He does the water spout thing, and then he looks at the crowd so everyone can see it's him, and he's lying, and that he's a crazy waterbender? It's over, brother. I'm sorry for what I had to do to you. Our father set us on this path. Fate caused us to collide. I don't get it. Like, I seriously just don't get it. Like, have I just spaced on an enormously important motivation for each of these guys each and every time I've watched this show? Why do you care about Yakone's plans for you decades after his death when you both hated the guy? That is seriously the both of you, your only motivation for wanting to take over the city? I can't believe Amon got you too. Hey, at least you unlocked your airbending. Unlocked? Are they really trying to sell me the idea she wasn't physically an airbender before she did it for the first time? That sentence isn't even logically consistent within itself. Yay! You ever think about how they thought this was only gonna be one season, so they made Boomy this weirdo wild man to play off his namesake, and then they just had to characterize him like that going forward? It will be just like the good old days. So this moment is, like, dark. Yeah, kind of gives you, like, a pit in your stomach the first time you see it. Like, wow, they just did that? They got away with that? That's crazy. And it is. But the shock feels more like, wow, they just did that in The Legend of Korra, and not like, wow, I can't believe Tarlock just did that. Like, when you think about how little we know about these two, how weird their motivations were, does this really add up to an oh-my-god moment? I don't think so. It's macabre, absolutely. And the imagery is cool. But I don't think I know about these guys who were absolutely just villains with unknowable motivations. Or at the very least, illogical motivations. Like, I guess Tarlock's pursuit of Republic City was his whole life, so him doing this might make sense. But this feels like another moment in the show where it's trying to be mature and dark, but it hasn't done the legwork to make me care about how mature it's trying to be. <laughs> We need to be patient with her. 
it will take time for her to accept what has happened. This finale episode is just filled with moments I have to go on and on about, so here's another. There was at least some discourse online at some point, I don't know if it's still alive at all, about how this scene is supposed to hint at Korra just wanting to throw herself from this cliff and end it all. And to me, reading that, I was like, Jesus Christ, what? Where the hell are you getting that? But if you really wanted to be a fancy pants, fucking asterisk, pushes glasses up, asterisk kind of guy about it, I could see the argument in that Korra is very sad right now, it's contextualized by the scene that just happened with Tarlock doing the same thing in Amon's single tear and then Korra's single tear falling off the cliff. I'm just gonna say it in the worst slow motion of the season. It's literally slow motion for melodrama, which is crazy. I guess with all that, I could see where you're coming from. All that being said, I never really got that vibe at all from this scene. Korra's upset and wants to be alone. We literally see her sit at Cliff's edges when she's upset and wants to be alone multiple times before this. She's our main character and we've had 30 seconds of her being sad about this. I think we need a little more than that to start thinking of extreme like that. <laughs> Not now, Tenzin. I just want to be left alone. But you called me here. Oh, hey, Ang, seemingly in the flesh. How'd you do that? I mean, Roku kind of did it the one time with Jong Jong, but there was some clear spiritual fuckery going on there. They went into like a void realm. I guess Kyoshi showed up basically in the flesh too and even talked to some random people, but she was also possessing Ang in that moment. Ang just rocks up like, what's good? And then physically energy bends Korra. So he's just like there, actually. Can avatars just be in the physical world again if they want? Bending is very much tied to your physical body. This isn't just some spirit world stuff without the void realm in the back. You have finally connected with your spiritual self. How? When we hit our lowest point, we are open to the greatest change. I like that sentiment enough, and honestly, the whole spiritual connection thing wasn't pushed as that big of a deal the whole season, so it kind of just being hand-waved isn't so bad for me. What is bad is that Ang just shows up and solves all the problems. He's literally like the lion turtle. He shows up, energy bends the avatar, refuses to elaborate, and then leaves. Solves the last big problem in the show for the main character, but everyone say it with me now. They thought they only had one season. They wanted it to end happily and get an Ang meeting Korra moment in there, so this is getting two birds stoned at once. In the context of it being only one season, it's not my favorite, but fine. Korra's avatar demonstration is pretty cool too. For both Roku and Aang, we got a moment where they show their mastery over all four elements in rapid succession. And I think this is a pretty cool way to do it for Korra. I love you too. Shut the fuck up. I don't want to repeat myself more because I've already said everything about Maka and Koro's relationship five times at this point. I don't believe it, I don't think it was written well at all, and I don't know why these two like each other. Good thing we got this temple with a bunch of rocks around it so Lin can demonstrate she got her bending back. Do you think just like in the first show, Aang said the lion turtle lines we didn't get to hear on the download? <laughs> The audience just didn't get to hear again, so Korra would understand energy bending. And we zoom out. That's it. That was going to be all of Korra. Okay, it's going to be a long outro because, man, there's a lot to say. Let's tackle the episode first. The episode needs to get so much done in so little time, it's a little crazy. This episode on its own isn't at fault for being so rushed. It's that we never got around to doing anything with the plot until over halfway through. For how much this episode had to do, it's not bad, but it is clunky and rushed. So much of the show's own internal logic just gets thrown out the window, and you ever notice that we don't even really get a big fight? The closest thing we get to it is fucking Gundam over here. And you really can't with Amon because they wrote themselves into a corner with him being able to just stop and kill anyone he wants with his mind. A corner which they wrote themselves out of by saying, well, no, actually this time she's allowed to do an air kick for no reason. That's how Amon loses. The rules just turn off. And like, Tenzin and his kids are in trouble for 90 seconds and then they get saved and then they just run off. Next time we see them, they're in the South Pole. More of the time code is dedicated to Asami and Bolin beating Hiroshi and this nothing character that showed up two episodes ago jumping around on planes than we get to defeating Amon. That's should probably take some precedence, right? Nothing in this episode seems like it's given the appropriate amount of time, and for that, I think it's a pretty weak finale. But alright, what about season one as a whole? Well, this is where the chickens have come home to roost, because now all of those moments where they thought they only had one season all have to add up to something on their own. It's a double-edged sword. So, does season one of Korra hold up on its own? I think, as a show, you know, it's pretty entertaining. The ideas and world and action can carry it to that level at least. But in the face of the previous show, Avatar The Last Airbender, I don't think it matches up. I think that when I say the first season of Airbender is the 
weakest. Most people would agree with that. Season 1 is good and all, but once again, it doesn't match up to the crazy highs that Season 2 and 3 hit. I think about 99% of people would agree with me on that. So I think it would be fair to compare the first season of each show, since they share that fact. And yes, it's not lost on me that 20 is a bigger number than 12. Airbender had more time, and it will benefit from that. But I think we can all agree, academically, 12 episodes should be plenty of time to make a strong season. Korra was trying to be a very different show, and it accomplished that at the very least. Our story is much more centralized than one location, so you would think you'd really get to know that location well and the characters that live in it, right? But I think that works against the show. In Airbender, our characters are challenged in new ways almost every episode, and through those struggles, we learn about them, and they learn about each other, and everyone learns about the world. It's a wonderful little recipe. But we don't have those luxuries in Korra. The early 1900s backdrop and culture rapidly falls into the background and becomes an afterthought after the first few episodes. And Republic City feels weird and empty, and we don't get to see any of our culture, which was a big part of what made Airbender endearing. We got to see this living and fleshed out world in new places every episode. But here, we're given largely one problem to deal with on a static location that gets less and less visually interesting as we get accustomed to it. Don't get me wrong, I don't need it to be exactly like Airbender, but you have to at least make an effort to keep me interested in the setting if you're gonna change the formula from that to this. But where I think the first season of Korra really stumbles is its character development. Let's start with Korra. At the start, Korra is a brash, egotistical, impulsive, headstrong girl who thinks she can take on the world, and is very quickly frightened of Amon. That's where she starts, but where does she end? She feels exactly the same. She doesn't act out as much now, because the show doesn't give her as many opportunities, but she still feels like she would. These qualities are never challenged, and Korra never struggles because of them, and because of that, there's no reason for her to change. Meanwhile, Aang's whole life is turned upside down. He just wants to be a normal kid, but he travels the world, and he sees that everyone is suffering, and that suffering, at least in part, is his fault, or at least that's the way he sees it. He doesn't get to be a carefree kid, because he has this duty. Like, just listen to where Aang starts the season. Why didn't you tell us you were the Avatar? Because... I never wanted to be. And where he ends. I wasn't there when the Fire Nation attacked my people. I'm gonna make a difference this time. And you know why he feels that way. Another point, Korra doesn't overcome any mental hurdle to airbend, she just does it out of desperation. Which is cool on a surface level, but much less meaningful than growing as a person and seeing things from a new view to learn how to bend an element. And yes, I know Aang got water bending right away, that's not the point I'm making. When Aang struggled with an element, it was because he had to grow as a person. That's cool, tie your character's magical growth into them maturing into their role as the Avatar. Seems pretty genius. And her fear of Amon too, remember that when I said I would get back to that like 10 minutes ago or something? She never even gets to overcome that. She cowers in fear from him right up until the point where her bending is taken, and then all the rules turn off and she sends him flying. That's not overcoming your fear, that's more like flailing for your life, and I guess the planet's just aligned, or Amon got distracted or something, he started thinking about dinner. And even her final tribulation, in the 11th hour, Ang just shows up and turns her bending back on. I didn't go on much of a journey with this character, she started the show as very capable with a very certain attitude, and she ends the show as very capable with the exact same attitude. I remind you, this was all they thought they had, they thought this was it, and every time I think about it, I just find myself thinking they didn't do anything with her. Alright, what about our other characters? Mako and Bolin, certainly our most secondary of characters, are similarly stale in their growth. Bolin doesn't change at all because he never gets any spotlight of his own at all, and Mako's only change over the whole show is that he starts liking Korra, and you already know that I think that wasn't executed very well at all. Back to Airbender, Katara grows in confidence like tenfold, and you get to see her waterbending perfect over the course of the season. Sokka goes from this weird sexist douchebag guy who thinks he's a great leader and thinker with a very narrow view of the world, to much more chill accepting and someone who's actually on his way to becoming the things he thought he once was. These stories are fun to follow because they're not just stories, they're these character stories. But not every character needs an arc to be interesting and a great addition to a show. Like, look at Iroh, he's fucking everyone's favorite, but he doesn't do much changing at all over the show, we just find out he doesn't really care for the Fire Nation all that much. And that's where Tenzin would come in. Tenzin fills sort of the same role and is pretty likable overall, it's just a shame he doesn't get a lot to do most of the time, but overall I don't think he's so bad. Asami is purely ornamental basically, she's a nothing character at this point. She's involved in the plot, don't get me wrong, but she's mostly just there to drive it sometimes, both metaphorically and literally. And then there's like, Lin, I guess? Lin's cool. I like Lin. So from all angles, from storytelling to setting to character, I think season one of Korra as a whole is kind of lacking, even when put up against season one of Airbender. It's still a good show, overall, don't get it twisted, but when stacked up to its predecessor, I can start to see some holes. Maybe if Korra had the extra eight episodes, I'd be singing a different tune, but we don't live in that world, and that's how I feel. Patreon shoutouts if you want to see the next two episodes of Overanalyzing Korra, 
ahead of the YouTube releases. You can support me on Patreon for just a few bucks. Link, as always, is in the description below the video. Biggest shoutouts of all go to my top patrons, Aurora, who, much like Jupiter, has a strange, never-ending, red-tinted storm system. Catch Adorable, who exercised a demon from their own body by beating them at Tetris. Gene Cree, who made a sand fort Knox, complete with sand barbed wire, sand military police, sand everything. Jacob1908, who actually does win all those iPhones and thousands of dollars and shit you see on scam ads. Lemon, who can feel underground water veins by placing their hand on the ground and raising one eyebrow really high. Omega Fighter, who had two completely separate musicals made about him at the same time, one in Japan and one in Brazil. Sean Martin, who found a perfectly preserved fossilized version of himself. He's still not really sure what it means, but it is a lovely talking piece to put in the living room. Tater of Tots, who created slow sand that actually pushes you into the air, weirdly. Thiago Nascimento, who did a Karate Kid-style crane kick to stop a break and entering at a local 7-Eleven. And William Fisher, who found a way to leave Yelp reviews for anything he wants, so now Elon is thinking twice about going to Mars since it only has a three-star rating. And of course, my other fuck you money patrons, Der 50 Kobold, Keep to Yourself, Keir Walsh, Leferg 13, Nicolens Photography, Queen Talia the Graceful, Roman J. Cop, Stephanie and Riches, The Former Meaning of Life, The 1 AM Party, Thomas Lodenbach, Whitrow, and Jean Wei Fu. And my god overanalyzers, Two Boots Are Beat, 9Y2Y, A Moss Covered Raccoon, Ethereal Catnip, Alan Garvin, Andrew Watchard, Austin Gallup, Black Smeme, Blue Food, Bob Def, Chandler Crump, Kobe Smith, Connor Gallery, Dead Rat Fiasco, Deathly Healer, Dizzy Payne, Dr. Xerox, Dominic Saint, Donut, Distent, Emma Not Emma, Aaron Grace, Gianluca, Leandro Magi, JL, Jada Jones, Jackson, John Ajaka, Justin Fletchall, Kai D, Kelly, Lord of Mordor, Mac, Mark Rethy, Medium D Speaks, Michael Fallon, Mighty Virus, Nick, Nicholas Abbott, Peter Bayron, Potato Scream, Reese, Rocket Miss, Ryan Gregorikos, Ryan Maxwell, Samuel Vanderplatz, Sean Flowers, Spicy Ketchup, Super Snipper, The Long and Short of It, Thiefy Mole, Thomas Graff, Turp Bobs, Varner, Victoria the Queen, and some sort of bear face. Next up, who knows?